to this point, everything uh, from the Magi has been, yeah, that's pretty standard. You go to the king, you get that permission to go to wherever. I mean, they're, they're following the cultural norms. And it is interesting then to ask the question, well, the things that we've been taught through song and story, if they're not absolutely correct, does that take away from what's going on here? And I would say no. I don't think it's taking it away. Because again, church tradition teaches many things that for a while is accepted. And then there comes a time where somebody goes, but should we? And people start examining scripture again and they start finding out something different. And, and I think that's an important thing to keep in context. Because here, in the meeting of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus with the Magi, <clears throat> the, the, <laughs> the initial audience that Matthew is writing to are, are being given a head fake. They are <laughs> having to uh, adapt very suddenly. Because Matthew's audience is a very Jewish audience. Yes, they are Jewish um, who, who believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but they would not have identified as Christian. They would not have seen themselves as anything other than Jewish who had, who had uh, observed the Messiah, or they've heard of the teaching of the Messiah. And so Matthew, in turn, then decides to start um, talk, talking to the people where they are in their context. Matthew doesn't force them to, to see the world differently yet, but instead goes to where they are. And that's why what's interesting is <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1 starts with the genealogy of Jesus. Now, genealogy is a very big thing in Jewish identity, and, and uh, the rod of Jesse, the, the, the spawn of David, or the, from the root of David's lineage, these are things that are important throughout most of Scripture. However, for Matthew... That's not as important as Abraham. And if you go back and read Matthew chapter 1, you find that Matthew is talking about Abraham being the descendant from which Jesus comes. It's not that the others were ignoring it, it's that the others had a different audience they're writing to. For Matthew's audience, they start with Abraham. Now, let's talk a little bit as well, too, about the, the Magi, the wise men. Who were they? Well, it's commonly believed, and, and, and not only from tradition taught, but seems to be uh, uh, from all that they can gather, um, seems to be pointing to the fact that these wise men are, um, they are from a, a church that follows Zoroaster. Now, it's, it's a deity that still has followers today. Uh, it's considered one of the oldest uh, religions that exists in the world. And, and in their tradition, they also have a uh, one God, one Messiah kind of thing. Whereas <clears throat> you have with like Rome and Greece and other countries that were around is that there are many gods, pantheons. Zoroaster had one god as well, too. And so um, this cosmic event of, of the star uh, that, that, that they followed, that's a sign for them. That's a sign that something important is happening, something uh, profound is occurring, and they want to see it. They want to be part of it. And so that's where they go. Now, in identifying that they are following Zoroaster or that they're from the East, the initial audience that would have heard this um, would have likely gone, wait, question, wait, why? Because this is a very Jewish audience, remember. And interacting with foreigners or outsiders was typically frowned upon. The community that they would have been raised within would have said, no, 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 keep the outsiders out. Keep yourself pure. Only interact with your people, your kind. Stay there. Close in. Close in. You know, build walls. Keep yourself safe. So for Matthew to take the time to say, no, there's, there's, there's people from the east here. This would have been a giant head fake for the Jewish people who heard this the first time. Not only would it have been a, a head fake, it actually would have been quite absurd. That's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. 
The Messiah is supposed to overthrow Rome. It's supposed to overthrow all worldly powers and reinstate, reinstall, if you will, um, the Jewish people to the prominence that is rightfully theirs, that they are to be the the nation of nations, that people are to come to them, that, that, that this is what's supposed to happen, that, that everyone's supposed to change to adapt to the Jewish people once God puts them in their place of prominence. But that's not what happens here. And the reality is, especially for the Gospel of Matthew, um, this is just the beginning of the absurdities. This is just the beginning of how crazy this is going to be. Because again, this is a typically Jewish audience who uh, are, are going to now have to accept some things that they may have struggled with. The first is the poor will be blessed, not the rich. In fact, the rich will be humbled. The, their king, their savior is going to be killed. Wait, what? The story of Jesus is going to turn everything for them upside down. And that's what this is. That's what Epiphany does. It turns everything upside down. And so for, for the Gospel of Matthew, this initial audience, they are, they are a living Epiphany. They are having to adapt to the fact that everything is being turned upside down. And it starts from the very beginning with the fact that everything they had been taught, all the tradition they had been taught, is now being challenged and thrown out the door. And it continues to be absurd when you see the gifts that are given. <clears throat> gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, gold kind of makes sense. If you're saying you're going to worship a king, you bring him gold. Yay, bring him gold. But here's the question. Why didn't they leave it with Herod? Or maybe they did leave some. Because this is the gold that the culture of the day would have expected that they leave as a gift, as a tribute to the ruling king of the land. That would have been Herod. So this gold didn't go to Herod. This gold went somewhere else. And then there's frankincense. Now, frankincense is, is an important uh, herb, and, and it's used uh, for rituals, uh, prominent rituals, um, to, to uh, really set the tone. I had a professor uh, in seminary, uh, Donna Tony Wilhelm, who, who often talked about the scents, the scents and the smells and the hears, the, the way the body is um, influenced during worship. And while in the Church of the Brethren, we might have a, a um, uh, what's considered a, a low church approach to it, there is this sense of, of sounds and smells convey different meanings. Um, and, and for the people of the time, frankincense would have carried with it an understanding that it was to be used in rituals by high priests. Only high priests were to use it. So for it to be given as a gift to Jesus would have been a way of saying that this baby is going to be a high priest. And then there's myrrh. Now, myrrh makes very little sense in any way, shape, or form if you use conventional wisdom. Because myrrh is used to prepare a body after it's been killed, after it's dead. Why would you bring myrrh to a baby? What now? These are the things that this initial audience of Matthew, this first epiphany audience, is hearing. Everything is different now. It's all changing. It's all new. So what are they going to do? How will they adapt? How will they exist within this child Messiah, born to poor people out of wedlock, who would come and tell people to serve as opposed to overthrow, who would bless the poor, the meek, who would challenge the religious scholars of the day, and who would eventually be killed. The, the, the story of Epiphany, the story of Jesus, is one that, that is, is based in absurdity. It's changing everything. And now the question is, will you change with it? Or will you be rooted in what you were taught? That's the question that Epiphany presents, both to the first audience 
that Matthew is writing to and to us today. Because the epiphany of God is, is stunningly contrary to the human way of doing things. Look at it now. Uh, I saw a, a meme that said, if the Apostle Paul were alive today, he would write to the churches of the world. I don't even know where to begin with you. The joke there being that, that the churches have, have gotten into fights over things that have not mattered. We have uh, allied with politicians when it suits our, our needs. We have um, chased people away who aren't like us. We have hidden beloved people and the wrongs they may have accomplished, they may have done. And yet we have turned away those who are most needy, wondering if they are worthy of it. Yeah, the celebration of Epiphany. It's not about three kings. It's not about gifts. It's about asking, are you willing to accept the absurdity of this nation? This nation of God. This nation of all oh man who doesn't see borders or boundaries. Who isn't beholden to lines made by governments. Who isn't beholden to any political power that may exist. Scripture would also tell us, do not put your trust in prince and princess, uh, the prince and, and, and uh, powers of this world, for they have no authority. Jesus is doing something different. And that's the way it is from the beginning. So it feels right then that Epiphany would be at the beginning of our calendar year. As a way of, of, of um, piggybacking, if you will, on this newness. It's 2022 and for many of us we keep wondering, is anything new anymore? See, it feels like the same old, same old. We are now in our... Um, second year uh, with 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 COVID, and many are wondering, will this ever end? Fair question. But maybe there's another question to ask. Maybe there's another question to look at. What absurd thing is God doing in this world right now? What absurd thing is God challenging us to accept? Is God challenging us to accept the, we the, the depth and the breadth of God's love? Is God challenging us to accept uh, teachings that may not actually be correct based on Scripture, but it's always been taught that way, so we just accept it? I find it interesting that in revealing Jesus to foreigners, to outsiders, to those who are different than the chosen people, the chosen people have to wrestle with the fact that the Messiah didn't come just for them, just for them who look alike, just for those who sound alike, who, who have similar thoughts, but for those who are different, those who they may not trust. Jesus came and served and taught and died so that life could happen in ways that no one thought possible. That epiphany changed the world. That epiphany is happening right now. That epiphany asks you, will you come along and be part of this absurd love of God? Because if you will, If you'll come along for this. Yeah. You can bring life where there was none. You can show love where there was hate. You can be peace where there is violence. You can be hope where there is none. In short, you can be somebody's epiphany of God's love. What a great thought. What a great goal. What a great new 
way to start this year. Amen. When we share our joys and concerns, we are actually offering a gift to one another. The gift of who we are. The gift of things that matter to us. And as such, whenever we hear those gifts shared, whether they be joys or concerns, we are saying to the ones who bring them to us, thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for trusting us to hold this gift of yours. On this celebration of Epiphany, I challenge you then to see the sharing of joys and concerns as a sharing of gifts. The gifts of what matters to one person or another. And that whenever you hold them in your prayer, you hold them as tenderly as you would a gift. Let us pray. Lord, we hear the gifts of one another. The things that matter to each and every one of us. The small, the large. Doesn't matter what the size is because in your mind and for those who are near to your heart, the size is not the question. The intent is. And so hear the prayers of one another. Hear the joys and the concerns, the worries and the celebrations, the anxieties and the calm. Hear all of what we have to bring. And may we in turn hear it of one another. May we in turn show it to one another. May we in turn show your love. We desire to do this, O God, because that's what you've asked of us. You did not demand it. You did not compel it. You asked of us. It is our choice. And we accept that choice. O Lord, hear our acceptance as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It only takes a spark to get a fire going and soon all those around will warm up to its glowing that's how it is with God's love once you've experienced it you spread his love to everyone you want to pass it on like spring you want to pass it on I wish for you my friend this happiness that I found you can depend on him it matters not where you're bound I'll shout it from the mountain top I want the world to know the Lord above has shown me love I want to pass it on
God's love Once you've experienced it You spread His love to everyone You want to pass it on So go now, sisters and brothers, and live in the season of Epiphany. Live into the world that showed the absurdness of God defied conventional wisdom and did beautiful things. Go now and be God's epiphany in this world, God's agents of love. Go now and be peace. Amen.